Today's scripture comes from the gospel according to Mark, the oldest gospel that we have. The sixth chapter, beginning at the first verse, listen for the word of God. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here among us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and to not put on two tunics. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, please bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, in this scripture, which is so rich, I want to make three points, pull out three ideas that will hopefully stay with you in the coming days, for you to think about them and how they, have, how they inform your life of faith, how they speak to you about what you are called to do. The first one that I think is very interesting, and it's even a little sad, is when Jesus comes to this place, Nazareth, his hometown, and he preaches, and although they realize that he's speaking wisdom and has done great deeds, they still doubt him. And they remember him as he was before. Before he went into the wilderness for 40 days with the Spirit. Before he sat down and read from Isaiah that the word of God was fulfilled in him for good news for the poor. Before he was able to go from town to town and place to place, healing people, some of whom had been sick for many years. And if you're doing the lectionary right now, and I forgot to ask Dan if he had done lectionary scripture last week, but he wasn't here last week. Oh, he wasn't here the week before. He was here. So did he talk to you about the woman with the flow of blood uh, who had been sick for 12 years and the child who was laying dying? And he cured both of them. Some people call that a miracle on the way to a miracle. He has done this before he comes back to Nazareth. And we know that many people had a lot of faith in him because that woman with the flow of blood followed behind him 
and eased up very carefully just so she could touch his garment because she believed that his power would flow from himself through his clothes and into her, and it did, and she was healed. And he told her, your faith has made you well. Then he returns to his hometown, and there is an absence of faith, because all they can do is remember him when he used to live there before he left. They probably remembered him as a child and a teenager. And this story reminded me of a time in my life when one of my children, I have four, I think it was the oldest one was getting, was graduating from high school. <clears throat> so I was about 45 at that time. And we went to the graduation and I was sitting with my mother and she said, do you remember when you did this when you were 15? Do you remember when you did that when you were 16? Do you remember when you did that when you were 17? And I said, Mother, I was a teenager. I am no longer a teenager. I have grown. I have changed. We all must go through that growth. Being a teenager is a wonderful time of life when you're just getting to know who you are, what your gifts are, where are your weaknesses, what are you being drawn to, what gives you joy, what do you think you want to study next, and then we move on. Well, there are always people who will want to pull you back. There is a branch of psychology called um, Family Systems, Murray Bowen. He worked with groups as if they were a system that you were analyzing from an engineering perspective. So he worked with families, hence the name Family Systems. He worked with companies. He worked with churches, with congregations, and with synagogues. And he said there is a way that these systems work, that when you grow and change, you've gone away, you've gone to school, you've gone into the military, you've traveled, you've learned, you've changed, you've grown. When you return to your family of origin or to some other group of people, with whom you belong, they will try to pull you back. They will try to make you back into the person you were before you grew, before you matured. And I think this is what the people in Nazareth were trying to do with Jesus. You know, almost it's as if they're afraid he's gone on without them. He has grown, he ha he's wise, he has wonderful teachings. He has power beyond what they would imagine, but they want to remember him as he was before. And Jesus acknowledges that. And his work, and your and my work too, when we're faced with those experiences, is to remember who we are now. Who has God led us to be? Who are we at our most mature, at our most loving, at our kindest self? Who are we? And remain that person even when your brothers try to pull you back into a fight over who gets the drumstick at Christmas or who gets to open their presents first. Whatever the silly arguments were when we were children, we remember who we are now. Who has God led us to become? And who is God leading us to become in the future so that we may serve Christ better? And Jesus could do no deed of power there because of their disbelief, except that he 
laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And what an amazing thing it was for those few people. He changed their lives. Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. This can even happen within churches, you know, within congregations, because congregations can grow and change as well and be pulled into a new mission and openness of showing God's love to the world around. And people can say, but no, I remember when we didn't do that. But remember who you are. Remember that God is calling you forward to bless this world. The second point comes in the next part of the passage where he sends... He sends people out two by two and gives them authority over demons, demons to cast out. Now, remember this was 2,000 years ago, and they have a different way of understanding reality than we have. We have changed our way of speaking, so we usually don't speak of demons. Some people don't even believe they exist but they do. And sometimes you hear people talk of their own personal demons. Frequently they're talking about what holds them back from being the fully mature person that God is calling them to be. Feelings of complete failure. Feelings of not being enough not being good enough, not being smart enough, not being wealthy enough, not being pretty enough, not being strong enough, not being moral enough. They're just not enough. And they fight with their personal demons. And some of these people lose the battle. Some people lose the battle into a bottle and alcoholism becomes their demon. Other people lose the battle by trying to put down other people in society and saying that they are better. And one of the worst ways that I've seen this is racism. To say that you are better because your skin is a different color, to say you are better because your nationality is a different nation, to say you are better because you come from the United States and not Mexico, not Sweden, not Belgium. These are demons. And we are here, I believe, to cast those demons out and to remind people that God loves each and every person on this planet that we were created equal in God's sight. We are loved, and so is the other person. There was a course that I taught a number of years ago by a um, Reformed um, theologian. It was called Space for God, talking about how we need to make time and space to pray every single day. And one of the things that he asked people to do was to imagine as they walk down the street being accompanied by their guardian angels, one on each side. And the angels would say, here comes a child of God. Here comes a child of God. And then after he fully embraced that, that God loves you and you are truly a child of God. Notice that everyone else on the street has angels too. And their angels are saying, here comes a child of God. Now one thing that my husband said this week that I thought was very interesting, and I've thought about it, perhaps you will too, 
is that one person can drive out these demons. You can be in a room with people and, they, and change the way they talk. When you say, I don't believe that, I don't think that's true. I know that person, and they are good. You can't say that about that person. You can change the tenor of the room and drive those demons out. Point three, when Jesus sent these people out, his first disciples, the twelve, and now he has so many more disciples to send out, you and me and everyone in here and everyone who is watching, all the other people and all the other churches, he's sending out to the world to bring that message of hope that people need to change they need to repent they need to show God's love they need to show the love to their neighbors but he's sending them out two by two because there is strength in numbers we need each other in this ministry that God has given us. We need to go with someone so that when we are down, they can lift us up. When they are down, we can lift them up. So that when I run out of ideas, you can say, but what about, what about this? And when you don't know where to go to look for a particular answer, perhaps I can remember something if my memory just works the way God wants it to work, and I think it would at that time. We need each other. We're better together when we do ministry. We're better together. How could you do Habitat for Humanity with one worker? It would be extremely hard. We are better together. We need each other, and we need to rely on the wisdom of our community, the energy of our community, the belief of our community. One of my theological professors in seminary said that he had really hoped that whenever we stand to say the creed, that we could say it, we believe, so that on a day when my faith might be dipping a bit, I can hear all the voices around me saying, we believe, together we believe. We believe in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe. And God has chosen us to carry this message to the world. When I was a hospice chaplain, there were many times that I sat by a bed and I would lead the prayers. And perhaps the person was so weak, they said, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure. And I could say, let me believe for you. I believe. And I know that God loves you. And I know that God has prepared a place for you. And I know where you are going. It is beautiful. I believe. I believe for you. I had one lovely woman with a brain tumor who knew that her time was getting close, and she said, I'm afraid. You know, if God would heal me, I know what my life would be because I'm here with my daughters. They take care of me. I don't know what comes next. 
And my answer to her was, you don't have to know. Because we know God is good. And whatever comes next is good because God is good and God loves you. God has prepared a place for you and for me, for each and every one of us. We are better together. So remember that as we grow and mature, as we become healthier people, stronger people, more mature people, there will still be those who will try to pull us back. Don't let them. Remember that there are demons in this world. There is evil. And we are sent into the world to dispel that, to say no to the hatred, to say no to the self-aggrandizement. That means that's a great word, but it's not used very often. It really means egotism. It means building yourself up that you are so good. I'm so good. But I'm so good, I'm so good. We say no. We are all good. And God loves us all. We say no to those demons. And we say yes to loving our neighbor and loving the world and making this a better place. And third, we don't go and do it alone because we have each other. And friends, we are better together. And so let us celebrate life, celebrate God, and remember that we have been called to carry God's word into the world. Friends, we are better together. Amen.